Okay, guys, we're live. We're live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whenever you're watching this video. And uh, welcome back. We're back for week seven of our level two course, uh, development skills for employment, personal fitness, and well being as well. Yeah, so a lot of skills that they're going to be useful, not just in the workplace, but also within a fitness environment in, and kind of taking the reins, I guess, on our own fitness journey and really. Um, yeah, I guess taking control of it and, and, and putting that into our own hands. Um, so, guys, a little bit of a, a recap on last week's session. But just before we jump into that, um, as we do, just to point your um, attention to the little description box below today's video. Um, in there, you're going to find, as always, all the extra information that you might need, be it supplementary learner info, um, anything else that you might need uh, regarding sort of safeguarding, learning safely online, what to do if you've got any concerns. That's linked in that description as well. Um, and of course, as always, we've got links to today's fitness video, which is um, all lower body. So we can get a good look at a wide range of lower body exercises for your circuit cards. Maybe get a few new ideas. Um, and there'll be a link to the survey in the uh, little description box as well. So like with all previous sessions as well, if you can just take 30 seconds to fill in that survey, um, it is massively appreciated. And helps us fill in some paperwork that we don't need to ring you and pester you for anyway. So, uh, yeah, guys, uh, make sure we get that survey done as well. And, of course, as always, um, there's a link to our, all of our social media pages in there if you want to know what's going on with Media Savvy, um, be it Diego's, be it what's going on the Savvy Towers, or even just what other sort of courses and, and what we're up to, I guess, uh, day to day. Um, so yeah, that is all in the description box as well as my email. So if you need that for any reason and you don't have it yet, um, as unlikely as that is, that is in the description box below as well if you need to get in touch with me. Um, as always, guys, if you're watching along live and you want to pop something in the chat, ask a question, come along and just say hello, good morning, by all means do. Um, always, uh, always awesome to uh, get a chance to say hi while we're on as well. Right, guys, right. Let's get to it then. So we are um, continuing on um, building on our circuit cards, really. So if I can just um, get my PowerPoint up. Um, okay, so like I say, we're on week seven. So if you're missing any previous weeks, again, let me know through email and I'll send you previous session links and make sure you've got those. Um, just to make sure that you can get A caught up and B, have a chance to go back and watch anything again that you might want to sort of revise or touch up on again. Um, okay then, guys. Okay, so last week we talked um, we talked quite a lot about um, planning a circuit training session and the things that we might consider, you know, be that space that you've got available, equipment that you've got available, <clears throat> how many members are you expecting to turn up, how hard do you want them to feel as though they've worked afterwards? You know, do you want it to be sort of on a scale of not to 10, you know, which is what I, I, I like to use when I'm working with my clients on a scale of not to 10, 10 being ready to pass out from exhaustion. Where are you on that scale? You know, you might want them working at a 10. You might want them closer to a seven or an eight. Um, you know, lots and lots of stuff that we talked about in last week's session um, that, I've used to plan circuits in the, in the past before. A um, couple of the snags that you might come across, you know, extra people turning up that you're not expecting and stuff like that. And maybe there's ways you could work around that as well. Um, almost like um, backup plans just in case. Um, we have, in the previous few sessions, we've talked a lot about body weight exercises. We've looked at um, exercises that use equipment as well and all the different equipment that we that we might use and of course last week um we were looking mainly at um health and safety issues to be aware of with um individual bits of equipment and just how to maintain them i guess how to how to um look after them how to store them making sure they're not um obviously at risk of getting damaged or, or inflicting harm on somebody as well when you think about the, uh, the health and safety side of stuff that we've looked at. Um, and 
we talk very briefly about skeletal muscles, but we're going to lead um, into that a lot more this week. Um, of course, one of the one of the sort of categories, I guess, one of the sections that you're putting on your circuit cards is going to be what muscles are used by that particular exercise. So we're just going to have a little bit of a of a recap on on the, some of the major muscles in the body, um, some of the major muscles in the body, and um, how they work, where they can be found, and we can maybe even talk about what exercises might stimulate that muscle and how we can work them if we wanted to. You know, again, coming back to planning a circuit training session, do you want it to be all legs, or do you want it to be all abs, or all upper body, or all cardio? Or maybe you want it to be a good mix. Obviously, that's going to uh, influence what exercises you pick. Um, how long is the session going to be? Is it going to be 60 minutes, 30 minutes? Um, how long is your set going to be? So are you working for a minute and then moving on, or 30 seconds and then moving on? How much rest are you going to have in between those sets? So there's all these things to think about. And like I was saying last week, um, there is no right and wrong way. Um to, uh, to sort of plan a circuit it just depends on what you would like the outcomes to be you know um and trying to sort of plan it that way i guess let that sort of shape your session um like i say you could get 100 pts in a room and ask them all to plan you um a 10 exercise circuit and they would all be different you know that's individual styles and again um what they want their sort of clients and their members to get out of those um, sessions or those classes. But main thing that we're going to need to know, or one of the main things that we're going to need to know in not just, not just planning and designing our circuit cards, but in using them as well, put yourself in the shoes of the, uh, of the gym member or, or the client. If you get to um, a circuit card that says, right, this, this exercise is going to work your quadriceps and your glutes. If you don't know where those muscles are, you don't really know what body part you're supposed to be moving or, or working. And so knowing what those muscles are, where they'll be found, is really, really helpful. Um, of course, you see it on, on a lot of exercise machines these days. They'll have like a little diagram of a person and then maybe have like in red the muscles that are going to be worth the most. Yeah. And then you might have like in a yellow, it might be sort of secondary muscles that are going to assist. Um and again, they might even have the names of them listed there as well. So um, if you are around that kind of equipment already, I would be, um, and always did try and use that to just get used to, right, okay, shoulders, or that, they're deltoids, yeah, oh, okay. And then remember that for next time. Um, right, guys, okay, so yeah, that was last week's recap. Like I say, today we're going to look at skeletal muscles, um, what makes, um, what defines skeletal muscle as well. Um, then we'll be moving on to um, putting yourself in the shoes of a um, gym instructor um, or putting yourself in the shoes of um, the class instructor, whoever is um, whoever's teaching the class. So um, how to conduct yourself professionally um, in terms of... Um, obviously building and maintaining a reputation, but also protecting yourself legally, um, protecting your client and making sure that they feel comfortable and at, at ease the whole time that you're working with them or that they're working with you. Um, and how to introduce yourself as well, or just some ideas, I guess, how to introduce yourself. There's a, there's more than one way to skin a cat, so they say. But um, yeah, how to introduce yourself um, in terms of just, giving yourself a good, strong footing um, to be able to build a relationship with a new client or gym member. Um, and at the same time, I guess really, it depends what sort of gym you're in, I guess, but really you, you want to almost be that person's port of call. If someone's come in for a like gym induction, it's their first time in the gym, they're just getting shown around and stuff like that. I used to see that as my chance to um, obviously make them feel welcome and make them and, and be friendly and introduce myself and to hopefully put some of their doubts and anxieties at ease about coming into the gym. But it was also a little bit about, right, when this person needs help, I want to be the person that they come to. 
Yeah, either in terms of, um, of course, just wanting to help people and point them in the right direction. I want someone to know that there's somebody in the gym that they can feel confident in or comfortable in approaching to ask for a little bit of help. And I guess there's also a little bit of, um, in terms of generating new business as well, when you're a self-employed personal trainer, um, clients don't, or, or well, certainly when you're starting, clients tend not to come to you. So um, it's a case of, right, okay, how can I sort of demonstrate value to people as well? So if you're, if you're that personal trainer, that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, you've got to demonstrate your value long before someone's going to be willing to pay 20, 25, 30 pounds an hour of your time. Yeah. So um, how to introduce uh, how to introduce yourself um, and obviously make the client feel at ease um, or as, as much as possible when you're in the gym for the first time. But like I say, also conducting yourself professionally, setting boundaries, not stepping over any boundaries, knowing where those boundaries are as well. So we're going to be um, talking about that in today's session as well, guys. Um, okay, then. Okay, so let's jump in um, and talk about our muscles to start off with. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. So when, we're, when it comes to muscle in the body, uh, and you may well remember this from um, the level one course that I know some of you have done. Um. So when it comes to muscle, we've got three different types of muscle in the human body. Yeah, so we've got three um, categories of muscle, you could say. So we've got smooth muscle, we've got cardiac muscle, and we've got skeletal muscle. Yeah, that's all well and good, Rob, but what are they? What do they do? So smooth muscle is exactly what it says on the tin. Um, it is muscle that is that is smooth uh, and is found um, in our organs um, or certainly the walls of our organs, be it our lungs, pancreas, liver, um, whatever it may be. And as well as that, we have our, um, sort of like our blood vessels as well, our arteries and our um, veins as well, made of that, made of that smooth muscle. So we've got, Smooth muscle, which is found in our organs, internally, obviously. Um, we have cardiac muscle. Um, now, the clue for what that does is, of course, um, in the name, if you've ever heard of cardiac arrest um, or, or any variations of the word cardiac, um, it's to do with the heart, um, which is, of course, where the word cardio comes from, cardiovascular exercise, because... Part of it is to do with the heart, the other part being the lungs and how they work together. So that is what we're doing when we're talking about cardio, um, cardiovascular exercise. Um, cardiac, it's all to do with the heart, guys, yeah. So um, cardiac muscle is found in the heart. It is the heart. And the heart is made out of cardiac muscle, um, which is um, totally separate to um, the, the, the smooth muscle that we've got um, in our other organs. So cardiac muscle in the heart, smoothing most of the rest of our um, internal organs, our blood vessels. Um, now, those two types of muscle are what we call involuntary because we don't control them. Yeah, your heart beats without you telling it to. Yes, we can control it. No, we, we can manipulate it a little bit. We could speed our heart rate up if we wanted to by running on the spot for 30 seconds. Um, or oh, we can bring our heart rate down by sitting still and resting and recovering for a little bit. Yeah, but we're not in direct control of our heart beating. Yeah, I am no good at multitasking. Uh, the best of times, if I had to tell my heart to beat every single time, I would have no bandwidth left for anything else at all. Um, you know, so luckily our heart beats by itself. Our stomach digests without being told. Um, our pancreas, our liver, our spleen all do their jobs without being told to do their jobs. Um, I guess even our lungs. Again, yes, we can sort of voluntary. We can choose to stop breathing for a second and hold our breath. Or we can choose to take a really deep breath if we want to. But when you're not thinking about it, 
you keep breathing automatically, don't you? So that is involuntary. It's not a voluntary choice that we make to, to, to move or, or to work that muscle, which leads us on to our third and our final type of muscle, which is the main one that we're going to focus on for today, and that is skeletal muscle. And again, exactly like it says on the tin, it is muscle that is attached to the skeleton, which essentially helps us move. Yeah, so our movement is our brain tells our muscle to contract, our muscles to contract or, or lengthen um, or to move. Um, and then that movement from that muscle doing what you told it to pulls the skeleton with it, yeah? I'm telling this muscle here to shorten to bring my hand closer to my head, yeah? So in order, I've, I've voluntarily turned on this muscle, yeah? And it, because it's attached to my skeleton, it's brought my bones with it. Thank you very much. Um, always handy. So that is, that is voluntary. I chose to do that, yeah? Most of the time, if I'm going to, if my hand's going to go above my head, it's because I've chosen to do that. I have to send the signal to this muscle to do whatever it needs to do to get my arm into that position. Yeah. So that makes it voluntary. So we have voluntary muscle, which is attached to our skeleton, which helps us move. Um, and these are the sort of muscles that you're probably thinking of when you think of the word muscles. You know, your arm muscles and your leg muscles and your bum and your abs and, and, and all of that sort of thing. Those are our skeletal muscles and they are voluntary. Chances are, like I say, um, my leg's not just going to kick out unless I tell it to and choose to. Yeah, we're all um, probably even without necessarily thinking it directly every single time. We are in control of moving those um, moving those muscles. Coming up, good boy. Um, oh my gosh, you might get a cameo from the dog this morning. You might pop his head in. Um, yes, yeah, so those are our three types of muscles: so smooth and cardiac, are totally involuntary. Skeletal is voluntary, yeah, and is attached to the skeleton, yeah. And we'll get a look at some examples. Oh, little hiccup there. Um, and look at some of the examples of those muscles in just a second. So just to recap, um, smooth muscle found in our organs, cardiac muscle found in our heart, skeletal muscle attached to the skeleton, and skeletal muscle is the only voluntary muscle, yeah, which is a muscle that you choose to move. Involuntary muscle, is a muscle that contracts without conscious control. Yeah, just like we've been saying. Okie dokie. So smooth muscle, like I say, is found in the walls of the um, hollow organs, like your intestine and stomach. Yeah, they are responsible for many, what you might call housekeeping functions. Um, I can say like digesting food, filtering your blood, and um, the muscular walls of your intestines contract, for example, to push food through your body. Yeah, so even your intestines contract, squeeze food through. Um, and, and, and that's just another one of these almost like housekeeping functions. Um, while we're on, a little bit of a tangent, but these housekeeping functions, your stomach digesting, you know, your lungs doing the breathing and your intestines contracting. All of these contractions and all of this movement takes energy, yeah, and takes calories. So um, you may find that, or you will find that everybody burns certain amount of calories every day just from doing this before you've even moved, yeah? Your body might expend 600 calories every day just maintaining itself doing its jobs on the inside yeah um so really really interesting that actually you know even brain function uses calories um any form of movement uh, uses those calories as well um which is why 
sometimes if you were on a, say you're on a 600 calorie diet, you know, or I mean, even what was, what was the magic number I heard recently? I, I, I spoke to somebody once it was on 750 calories a day um, and felt absolutely awful and had no energy to do anything. And I'm like, well, all of this that's going on in your body, brain function, like I say, swallowing, stomach digesting, all of that, it could burn, like I say, easily 700 calories a day anyway. So the food that you're eating is only giving you energy for this to happen. That's not energy for running or walking or exercising or dancing or singing or whatever it is that you enjoy doing. Yeah, so that's why often we need more calories than we think. Yeah. Someone, I've, I've heard people um, over the years say, well, I've, I've only burned, I've been to the gym and burned 500 calories today. That means I can only eat 500 calories because that's all I've burned. It's like, no, you're probably going to burn another thousand. Um, just from stuff that you don't realize burns calories. There is stuff outside of exercise or gym exercises that burns calories. Your body doing its job burns calories. Doing the washing up burns calories. Pushing the hoover around burns calories. More often than not, guys, we need more calories than we think we do. Yeah. And then you go into a low calorie diet and it's exactly the same as trying to move a car with no petrol in it. You've got no fuel, so you haven't got the energy to do the exercise and get the endorphins and feel good and stimulate the muscle and make progress and stuff like that. So just make sure guys, um, like I say, if you need any additional one-to-one -one help, um, I've got a little thing that I'm going to mention at the end of today's video where you might be able to find us and get a bit of one-to-one -one help, but definitely stay away from diets that are telling you to eat less than a thousand calories a day, hundred percent. Um, right guys, diversion aside, um, I, uh, a little, little bit of a tangent, but I, uh, I like to make sure that people aren't um, feeling like starving themselves is the only way to make progress. Because, um, yeah, our body needs more calories than we think. Um, right, guys. Okay, doggy. Um, so that is our smooth muscle. And just some of the, some other examples there that we can see of smooth muscle is um, obviously the trachea. Um Lungs and heart, we've mentioned liver, stomach, spleen, kidney, pancreas, colon, uterus, all smooth muscles, guys. And again, none of these you control um, directly. Yeah, um, it's involuntary. That's smooth muscle. Oh, okay, then. So next one we've got is cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscle. Um, tissue works to keep your heart pumping through involuntary movements, yeah? Um, it's one feature that differentiates it from skeletal muscle, muscle tissue, which you do control. Which is pretty much what I was just saying a minute ago, guys, in the sense that um, you don't tell your heart to beat, um, but you do directly control skeletal muscle tissue. Um, so the way that the heart works um, is through specialized cells um, called pacemaker cells, and they control the contractions of your heart. Um, and I, I found this absolutely amazing because I, I was familiar with the term pacemaker as in an electrical device that we can add to our heart, or you can have obviously um, implanted as, as a surgery or an, or an operation. Um, you can get a pacemaker put in. But um, I found it really fascinating to, to find out that the cells themselves that originally do that job are pacemaker cells. So um, if you're putting a pacemaker in, they're doing the same job. And that's where the name comes from. It's really cool. I just thought it was a fancy name for an electronical thing that we'd come up with. Um, so, yeah, um, that's the big difference from, from cardiac muscle to others, to be honest. It's involuntary um, and... It is, that's all it's doing. It's working to keep your heart pumping um, and to get that blood around the body, get the oxygen where it needs to be, um, as we've looked at in the past, yeah. And get the, get the oxygen to where it needs to be. Muscles can continue to work. Organs can continue to do their jobs, um, albeit involuntary, as we now know. Okay, guys, so that's smooth. 
and cardiac muscles that are involuntary. And then we've got our skeletal muscles. Yeah. So these are the ones, like I say, that you're probably thinking of a little bit more when we're talking about um, muscles. Yeah. You know, these are the sort of muscles that um, you probably spring to mind when you think you're going to the gym or lifting weights. Um, and these are the ones that people spend, you know, decades of, if not their whole life, working on and maintaining because they're really the ones, they're the ones that we can see. Yeah, or they're much more prominent. Um, right, guys. So skeletal muscles are the only voluntary muscle tissue in the human body. Yeah. So there's a lot of muscle that we control, but it's the only type of muscle. Yeah. In the body that we do control. Um, and, con uh, and control every action that a person consciously performs. Yeah. Um, like if I want to raise my shoulders, you know, that needs to be a conscious effort yeah tilt your head it's all it's all conscious uh, and, I, and i'm in control of that movement um so most skeletal muscles are attached to two bones across a joint yeah so again coming back to the um come back to the bicep um so we've got the bone in my upper arm yeah We've got two bones in the lower arm, yeah? So there's something connecting this bone to one of these. It's essentially, it's a big elastic band, yeah? So our muscle is, I think of it like a big elastic band. If I want that elastic band to get shorter and contract, that, like I say, pulls my forearm in closer to my body, closer to my head, um, because it's attached here, and attached up there as well. So when that shortens, it has to pull this closer. Yeah. Um, and pretty much. So I, I don't want to say all, but most of our skeletal muscle um, works in that way as well. Yeah, your knee, of course, is exactly the same. Your thigh muscle on the front of your leg um, is attached to, like, under your knee as well. Yeah. So, like, um, the front of your leg, um, which is what helps us straighten your leg out when you want to straighten it out in front of you. Um, cool. Right, so let's get a little look. So, yeah, most skeletal muscles are um, attached to two bones um, across a joint because then when the muscle moves and does its thing, the joint can do its thing and allow the bones to move. Yeah. Um, and we may get time to look at the different types of joints. Um, as well, because your elbow joint moves that way and no other way, really. No matter what you do, your elbow moves in the same direction. You can't do like a big circle with it like you can with your shoulder. Yeah, so we've got different types of joints in the body, but more on that later. More on those later. At the minute, let's just focus on these muscles. Yeah, so let's get a look at the, um, I guess, the front of the body. And they're the major muscles that you're going to see. And certainly the muscles that we're going to be picking um, for our circuit cards and working on our circuit cards. So one thing I want you to have a little think about while I'm working through and talking through these muscles, I want you to have a little think about what exercises that you know already or that we've talked about in the past um, will work that muscle. So if I'm talking about pecs, if I'm talking about this, the chest muscles, the pectorals, have a little bit of a think about what exercises they might um, might work those muscles. Yeah, even just one. If you can get one, you can make a note of it. Then when you get to the end, you might look and you say, right, okay, um, I've got exercises for most of the muscles, but I don't know what exercise I can do that's going to work this muscle here. Yeah, and that might be where we can, um, I might be able to give you a little bit of advice or maybe it's where you can just research, right, what exercises work, the quadriceps or the glutes or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, yeah, while I'm working through, um, maybe it's just even have a think what exercises would work that muscle. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, okay. 
So on the front, can I zoom in again? Or am I only getting the one? I think I'm only getting the one. Uh, okay then, guys. So what we've got. Um, let's start at the uh, the shoulders. Um, obviously we have skeletal muscle on our face. Um, that's what helps us raise our eyebrows. Uh, so it helps us smile. Uh, so it helps us frown and pout if that's what we're going to do. Um, although you're not going to really see. I've never yet seen an exercise on the in the in the gym or a machine that works your face muscles. So we don't need to worry about that too much. Um, then we've got muscles in like in and around the neck which we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about this rear view picture here on the right, because we can see that muscle um, is a lot more prominent on the, the rear side of the body or the, or the posterior. Um, so we'll start with the, uh, the torso then at the front. So we've got the pectorals. Yeah, we've got the pecs that um, if you start on the sternum in the middle of the chest and fan out almost towards like the armpits, yeah? Um, so we've got those chest muscles there called pectorals. Um, so like I said, just having a little bit of a think what exercises might work what. Um, chest exercises. Trying to think. You could always, like I said, jump online and, and like I said, just type in chest exercises, pectoral exercises. Um, some of my favorite ones for chest, um, especially when it comes to circuits. Some of my favorite pec exercises are um, press ups, push ups, whatever you want to call them. Um, bench press, lay down on the bench with the bar coming down to your chest and pushing it back up. Um, and then we've got like. Um, isolation exercises that would work that muscle sort of by itself. Um, so if I was to lie down on my back with a weight in each hand, instead of doing a push, I could do like a wide arc. Almost like you're giving, giving the air a hug. Obviously you're laid down, so you'd be hugging upwards. Um, and that's working that, that chest muscle, because as you come out, it stretches. As you come back in, it shortens and almost like bunches up a little bit. And you can even you can even feel that. And um, put your hand on your chest and bring your hand from there across, and you'll feel this muscle stretching, and you'll feel with this hand the difference. Yeah, between that muscle when it's contracted and tensed uh, and stretched. Sorry, um, and all of these muscles are going to be the same to an extent. You know, again, the bicep works the same. Um, this one here, um, but we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, again, shoulders and the shoulder muscles. Now we've got three. So our shoulder muscles are what we call the deltoids, yeah, the group of deltoids. Um, and then we've got three individual deltoids on each side. So we've got the front, the side, and the rear deltoid um, on, obviously, on each shoulder. So if I do a front raise and bring my arm up in front of me nice and straight, that works the front of my shoulder. However, if I put my hand on my side and do it to the side instead of in front, that works the side of my shoulder. Yeah? And if I was to get something there and pull it backwards, that's going to work the back of my shoulder. Yeah? So three different parts of the shoulder almost require moving through three different ranges to activate them, yeah? You could do, if you stood and did a thousand of these, you know, with a weight in each hand, you've really only still worked that front part of your deltoid. The rear can't get involved very much through that range, so you need to come to a different range where you, where you feel that must engage a little bit more, yeah? And again, a good way you can do that um, is just put your finger on it. If a muscle hardens up or tenses, it means that it's it's working. If you can find a way to let that muscle rest, then obviously it's resting. For example, again, if you put your finger on the front of your shoulder and lift your hand, it probably goes quite firm. Yeah, but then come down, just let your hand rest, and that same muscle will become a lot softer. Yeah, and that'll, that'll give you an idea of, is that muscle under tension? Is it working? Is it active? Or is it not? 
Yeah. So again, you might like to say, just want to feel, come to there, come around to the side. And when you feel that tension change, you know, you've got a different muscle engaged. Yeah. So we've got our deltoids, we've got our front, side, and rear deltoids. Um, so and obviously I've just given you a few examples there of what we could do, um, be it a sort of standing press or a seated press, whatever you wanted to do. Um, you know, I've seen people do side raises, front raises. Um, obviously, um, it's hard to demonstrate being on camera and being like wired into the laptop, but you can do like a front raise, um, not a front raise, rear delt flies as well. So the same movement as hugging, but this time, if you're facing the floor, because you're working against gravity, the back of your shoulder works this time instead. Yeah. To be fair, you may well be better off um, Googling pet flies. Yeah. Um, and get a, get a good idea of what that exercise looks like. Um, and the bent over flies as well. Um, okay, guys. So we've got, yeah, pe pectorals in the chest, deltoids in the shoulder. Um, from there, let's work our way down the arms. The main other one in the front of the arm that you're going to think about really is going to be the biceps. Yeah, so we've got the biceps on the front of the upper arm. Yeah, on the front of the upper arm, we've got the bicep. And again, you can actually feel the difference between that being um, stretched or contracted. When people are giving it the old flex, and tensing their bicep, that's all they're doing. They've, they've just contracted it as much as they can. Yeah? Because like I say, if this hand comes that way, this muscle here gets longer. If this muscle here gets shorter, it brings in my hand towards my head, like I say. Um, and again, you put your finger on that muscle. There, it's quite raised and it's quite firm. As I come out, it gets smaller and smaller because that muscle is stretching. Yeah? Um, so, again, in that hinging at the elbow movement, be it there, um, whether you're sort of more trying not to kick the dog, whether you're sort of more front on like that, whether you've got your arms out to the side and are pulling in that way, it's all this one muscle pulling in towards your body or contracting um, to work those biceps. So that's what those muscles are there, guys. They all, those are biceps. Um, and their main job really is bending the elbow. Um, their main job isn't to um, necessarily get tensed everywhere when nobody's asking for it. Um, but everybody, everybody loves a good bicep. Um, right, guys. Okay, so um, pecs, deltoids, biceps. Um, then back down to, to the torso, we've got our, um, so you might be thinking of this area as kind of like your core. Yeah. And that, that's not, that's not wrong. That's not wrong. And um, this is your core. Um, however, this is also your core. Your core is your full trunk. Yeah. Almost like, like a tree trunk. Your core is, is that whole torso to its center, to its core. Yeah, that's why it's called core. It's not just our abs, which is what we're looking at here. Yeah, our core includes our pelvic floor, our diaphragm, all of those deeper lying muscles. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about our abs or our abdominals, um, which is the six pack muscle. Yeah, it's the six pack muscle, but it doesn't obviously run all the way through your body. It just, it's the outer wall of your stomach, really. It's the front wall of your body. Yeah, obviously, inside is, is hollow for our internal organs and stuff like that. So it's not empty, do you know what I mean? Although it's hollow. Um, but yeah, when we're talking about our abdominals, it's like two sheets of muscle that make up the front of our torso. Yeah, and... That's what we're looking at here. One and two. Yeah. Which is why not everybody's six pack lines up the same because they might be a little bit off center like that. 
So you might have like almost staggered abs. Um, but that's what we're talking about there. So when we're talking about abs, or abdominals, it's very different to talking about core. If you think back to the body weight exercises session, you know, when we were looking at the difference between sit-ups and planking. So planking is a core workout. Planking will also engage our lower back, our glutes. Sit-ups is an abs workout. Yeah. Sit-ups work your abs and nothing else. Yeah. Um, so if you work these muscles all the time, they get really tight. If you don't work these muscles very much, they don't get very tight. And then you end up almost like increasing how hunched you are. Yeah, because you've got tension at the front of your body trying to almost like pull everything down and there's no tension at the back to counter it out, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So yeah, guys, when we're talking about our abs, this is what we're talking about here. Yeah. Our outer wall of our stomach. And believe it or not, everybody does have them. You know, you have people say... I've had people say to me over the years, oh, I don't have abs, I don't have abs. You do, we all got them. It's just a case of how visible they are. And what changes that is, is body composition, how much body fat we have on top of them. Um, and in general, it doesn't take a large amount of body fat to um, hide our abs. Yeah, or to, or, or, or to make them um, less visible. Or, or, or um, to almost sort of like obscure them a little bit. So we do all have abs, um, which, you know, again, it, it's again it's another little bit of a tangent, but I've been asked it that many times over the years. Um, I, I, I like to get it out there. Um, when it comes to obviously, um, we're, 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 we're training our abs there. We're not training our core. Um, and that's why if you try and do, a million sit-ups, it's never, ever going to um, A, burn fat around your waist um, or make your abs more visible. If they're hidden by a little bit of body fat, you know, they're going to stay hidden until you make um, efforts to reduce your body fat, which is, of course, dietary and a little bit more calorie control and stuff like that. Um, I've had people who have said, I want to work on my stomach. How many, what, what, what abs exercises should I do to um, build my core, core up and get a six pack? I'm like, well, we need to look at your food more than anything, really, um, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, again, um, big difference between our abs and our core. This one here is our abs, the outer wall of our stomach. Yes, it works during planking alongside other um, muscles. Again, if you're just doing sit-ups and crunches, it tends to just be this that's working, really. Down the side of our core, we have our obliques. So you've maybe heard of that term before. Maybe not. It's not as common um, as, as abs and stuff like that. Um, but obliques, um, again, they are... Um, they're, they're always there. It's just a case of how visible they are. It's the same as all of these muscles, to be honest. You know, we've, we've, we've got them. It's just a case of how strong they are, how developed they are, or how hidden they are by our body composition. Um, and that's, that's part of the beauty of the human body. We are, of course, all different, yet share so many similarities. Um, it's a bit, bit mind-blowing. Um, okay, then, guys. Okay, so we've done... Our um, pecs, deltoids, biceps, abdominals, and obliques. Yeah, so those are the main muscles in the in the upper body, um, at the front anyway. And when it comes to lower body, again, we've got skeletal muscle in our hands and our forearms for gripping stuff. Um, but, you know, when we're thinking about our circuit cards, um, you're probably not going to make a whole station just for gripping muscles, you know. Um, so we won't spend too much time on those. Um, okay, then. So the, the 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 next and the last, really, for the front of the body, um, it's kind of from the waist down to the knee. 
um, and that, of course, being the front of your thigh muscles um, or your quadriceps. Yeah. So because there's uh, was it one, two, three, four of them, they are called the quadriceps quad four quad as in like a quad bike. Um, so yeah, a quad meaning four. So we've actually grouped together four muscles here into one, what we call a muscle group, really, or a muscle grouping. Um, yes, there are very precise, specific ways to work this one more than this one, for example. But if you do a squat, it's going to be challenging all of these, yeah? So we tend to work our quadriceps together. Um, and be it like... Um, like a leg extension if you're just kicking your leg out straight in front of you sort of thing um like extending at the knee going up a stair pushing something with your legs um all uses these quadricep muscles there so what we've actually got here in the quadriceps is the biggest muscle group in the body yeah the biggest group of muscles in the body um, and obviously you can see that there's a lot of muscle in the back of the leg as well, which we'll get to in just a minute. So stands to reason. And it is fact, um, that doing an exercise that works all of this muscle, be it even just a, like a tuck jump or a squat jump or a squat cause you're working all of that muscle. Your body then needs to replace the oxygen that you've used, yeah? Your body, your muscle needs oxygen to, to work. So if you're um, working these muscles, you're going through more oxygen. Your heart rate comes up, you burn more calories, yeah? Certainly as opposed to if you're working um, this little muscle on the front of your shoulder, yeah, the front delt. So doing a front raise doesn't work my body and my lungs and my heart anywhere near as hard as a squat. Yeah, because a squat is using all of this muscle. A front raise is just using this little tiny muscle. Yeah. So my body can keep up with that demand for oxygen a lot better. However, if you're trying to burn calories, you're better off working your bigger muscle groups. Yeah. Which is why a lot of my circuits used to be um, exercises that worked as much muscle at once as possible. So in my circuits, you wouldn't be doing bicep curls and just working this muscle here, you know? Um, you might be doing a pull-up. Yeah, you might be doing a pull-up on the bar where you're working that muscle there still, just the same as a bicep curl. Pull-up, you're working the same muscle, but I'm also working this muscle and that muscle and other muscles as well. Yeah, so the more muscle you can work in one movement, the more calories you're going to burn and the harder you are going to work. Um, hopefully that makes sense, guys. Again, any any questions with some of these extra bits that I'm sort of throwing in there, please let me know. Um, it's more from, um, again, just experience as a PT and, and, and planning sessions um, that I think might be useful to you. And so those are the main ones in the front of the um, body, of course, using the quads. Um, even if we're cycling, running, it's using those quadriceps as well. Um, right, so we had just a recap. Pectorals are the chest muscles, deltoids in the shoulders, biceps on the front of the arm, abdominals on the front of the torso and obliques on the side of the torso. Um, and then quadriceps on the front of the thigh there, yeah. Um, which leads us nicely onto the uh, end of the rear view um, where we've got, uh, like I say, the muscles on the back of the body. So we've got, um, first big one really um, is, the, is, is the traps of the um, trapezius. So we've got starting from the base of the skull, over into the shoulder joint. So it's it's this one here that you see from the front, almost like the, uh, the neck bumps. Uh, we've got those. Um, but we can see from the rear view, it fans out of the shoulder, 
comes back in and then drops down and actually attaches to the body or the skeleton. Remember, we're talking skeletal muscles. It attaches to the skeleton halfway down the spine. So this muscle here isn't just here in your neck. It runs all the way down um, or, or half the way down your back as well. It leads out into your shoulders, which links in massively with our posture. Where are our shoulders at the day? Are they up here? Are they down there? Are they rounded forward? Um, if you were to push your chest out and try and pull your shoulders back, that would be one of the main muscles that's helping you do that. Yeah. In that sort of um, retracting the shoulders and pulling them backwards. Um, however, the most effective way I've seen um, the traps exercised is simple, just through shrugs, one weight in each hand, let them hang by your side. And then you just lift your elbows up towards your ears and then back down again. Yeah. And that eventually is going to get that muscle there nice and warm. And, uh, and, and you're going to know about it. Um, there are other muscles that you might, uh, there are other exercises that you might do to work sort of further down the um, traps, be it like a face pull, um, Maybe even like a really wide row where you're pulling the bar in towards your chest or something like that um, to work lower down the traps. But that's what those are there, guys, uh, the, uh, the traps. Um, we've mentioned, of course, rear delts. And we've got rhomboids in there as well between your shoulder blade and spine, so almost underneath the traps. Yeah, so again, if you want to pull your shoulder blades in towards your spine, those rhomboids are going to work and uh, like from here and pull inwards to pull your shoulder blades together. Um, then we've got, coming a bit further down, we've got what we call our lats or the latissimus dorsi. Um, I, I think all of these names pretty much come from, uh, come from Latin somewhere. Um, the latissimus dorsi is probably one of the most uh, obvious Latin ones in there. Um, they'll often just get called lats. You'll hear them referred to as lats more often than not. Um, and then they're these here on the side of the body. So they almost like, again, flare out into the armpits. And again, it depends how developed they are. Of course, you see some people where you can barely see their lats from the front. And then you see people who, you know, I've got lats that big. They look as though, even from the front, that they might jump off a building and uh, be able to glide. Um, again, if we were to go to... Um, trying to see if I can find a good uh, find a good example of where these lats are. Um, but again, like if you were to put your arm out to the side, put your hand towards the back of your arm and feel and start across, to come across to your armpit, you might actually be able to get hold of some of your lat um, or, or sort of touch it and, again, just get a feeling for when it's working. Um, so that's really the main one is probably going to be like a, either a, um, like a pull-up yeah, rather than a chin up, because with a chin up, you use your biceps a lot more. Maybe it's a pull up to get those lats working. Um, or um, again, like like a seated row. You can see like a lot of row variations will work the uh, work the lats as well. So again, might be one that you want to have a little look into, a um, little bit of research what exercises, you know, are, are good for working those lats. Um, okay, then we've got, uh, let's do the back of the arms while we're up here. We've got the we've got what we call the triceps. So the back of the arm is the tricep. Uh, the front of the arm is the bicep. Um, nice little way that I use to remember the sort of anatomy of these. Bicep has got two parts to it. One and two. Yeah. Um, the key being the word bi, bicycle. Um, two wheels. Um, the tricep, maybe you're one step ahead of me, um, has three. Tri, like a trident. 
um, of a tricycle, obviously. So we've got one, two, and three parts of the of the tricep. Yeah, um, exactly the same as why this is a quadricep. There's four of them. Yeah, um, so the clues in the title sometimes. Um, the tricep works opposite to the bicep um, in the sense that I'm saying with the uh, with the hinge in at the elbow. Yeah, so we've got... Um, coming back to this example I've used a couple of times, if I um, shorten my bicep to bring this closer to my head, this muscle on the back of my arm does the opposite. It has to get longer. Yeah, as this one shortens... This one here um, has to stretch to give me that space, if that makes sense. Yeah, one gets shorter, the other one gets longer. If I want to bring my hand back to where it started, the tricep gets shorter and the bicep extends back to its initial position. Yeah, so that happens so often in the body. You've got one muscle um, working opposite another muscle. Um, the quadriceps and the hamstrings work the same in the legs. Um, if I want to bend my knee and bring my heel up towards my bum, um, the hamstrings get shorter and the quads lengthen and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so guys, while we're on, let's just get finished up. So uh, three in the um, rear lower um, part of the body, we've got um, the glutes or the gluteus maximus. Now the gluteus maximus is the biggest single uh, muscle in the body. So over here, we've got the quads, biggest muscle group. Over here, the glutes, biggest single muscle. So if you're doing exercises that work those and those, you can be burning so many calories at one go and stimulating so much muscle. Um, probably so much more than you would if you were on the treadmill just doing cardio or, or, or something like that. Um, so again, think about what do you want the sort of focus of your workout to be? Um, and, you know, should we be thinking about these exercises that use a lot of muscle in, in one go? Um, so those are the glutes. Um, so again, squats, um, kickbacks, glute bridges, um, frog pumps, all exercises that work the, uh, the, work the glutes. Um, then we've got hamstrings at the back of the leg. Um, might be a term that you're familiar with. Um, it was one that I got familiar with quite young playing football, um, be it hamstring injuries or seeing famous footballers get hamstring injuries and stuff like that. Um, so we've got hamstrings on the back of the leg um, and then we've got our, our calf or our gastrocnemius really. Um, like I say, if, it's handy to know what the real name is. If on your circuit card you wanted to write calves, that'd be totally fine. Yeah, because Joe Public, who isn't a qualified PT, is going to step up to the circuit card and go gastrocnemius. What's one of them? Whereas if it just says calf or calves, it's a little bit more straightforward. But for you, um, it, it pays to know what the proper name is. Yeah, so our proper calves are the gastrocnemius, hamstrings, up in the glutes, and then just working back up the body, we've got our latissimus dorsi or our lats, um, our triceps, rear delts, lats, um, uh, not lats, uh, traps, sorry. Um, and yeah, that, those, those, are the, those are the main muscles that you're going to see um, on most machines in a gym, on most equipment in gyms, and you're probably going to work them they're the muscles that are going to get worked the most during during circuits, really. Um, even with the with the wide uh, array of exercises that we've got available for us when we're doing them as well. Um, righty, righty, right. Let's try and come out of here. There we go. There we go. So yeah, the main ones: pecs, abs, biceps, quads. And deltoids, yeah, just take 20 seconds, see if you can remember, identify, point on the screen to where each of those um, were or are in the body.
And then we'll move on, do the same on the rear in just a second. Okay, guys, so hopefully we identify pectorals on the chest, abdominals on the stomach, biceps in front of the arm, quadriceps in front of the thigh, and deltoids are found on the shoulders. Yeah, or are the shoulders. So again, 20, 30 seconds, try and do it on the back. Trapezius, deltoid, triceps, latissimus dorsi, gluteus maximus, hamstrings, and gastronemias. Again, I'll give you just 30 seconds to try and identify where those are on the screen. Okay, guys. Okay, so hopefully we've got the uh, the trapezius on the neck, deltoids on the shoulders again, triceps with the back of the arm, latissimus dorsi are our lats, gluteus maximus is our bum muscle, hamstrings back of the leg, gastrocnemius, and down here are our calves. Yeah. So even if we got one or two of those that we didn't know at the start of the day, well done. Um, remember, this video will always be there if you do want to come back and revise or use it for um, planning your circuit cards um, and getting some ideas for exercises and stuff like that as well. Um, right, guys, right, right, right. Um, let's have a... Um, same again, well, I'll... It's just been five minutes. Um, some of these are um, bones as well. So we'll have a little bit of a recap on our skeleton knowledge while we're on. Um, but yeah, we have got um, just a little, see, uh, what's the one? Crossword. Crossword's the one, not word search. A little crossword to do um, there on the screen. So we'll give it a few minutes and just see how many of these words we can get. Now I'm going to read through the clues now. Um even if instead of doing it as a crossword, if you feel like you know any of the answers, just write them down. Number one, number four, whatever. Um, as I'm reading through, write your answers out, and then we'll get a look at the answers in just a minute on the uh, on the next slide. Yeah, so I'm going to read the questions out. If you um, if you think you know, write it down and have a guess. Like I say, it doesn't have to be exactly like the crossword. Um, okay, so some of these are muscles or bones. But the clues are a little bit um, outside of the box. Yeah. So this one will be a, a little example of that. So it's the word in geometry that's a line from the perimeter of the circle to the center. Yeah. Which is also the word is radius. Yeah. The radius from the center of the circle um, to the perimeter is the radius. The radius is also the name of the um, bone in the forearm as well. Yeah, we've got the radius in the forearm. Okay, guys, so number uh, question four. Um, what is connected to the tibia? Number five, what is referred to as the funny bone? Number 13 is a two-headed muscle that lies on the upper arm between the shoulder and the elbow. Clue there being the two, two-headed muscle. Um, the thinner and longer bone uh, found out of the two bones in the arm. 15, sometimes called the shoulder blade. 16, the biggest and strongest bone in the body. 17, sometimes seen at a barbecue. 18 is the tendons at the back of the lower leg. 19 is one of the muscles in the quadriceps. And 20 runs from its two heads just above the knee to the heel into two joint muscles. 
down, we have got another word for your butt. Um, also known as your abs. Um, a large muscle group that contains four muscles. So again, think of the four. Um, runs from just below the knee to the heel and is involved in standing and walking. Number eight, the bone that we often call the collarbone. Number nine is the muscle forming the rounded shape of the shoulder. So again, think about what muscles we've talked about this morning on the shoulders. Another name for the kneecap. Another name for the breastbone. And the muscle mainly responsible for straightening the arm. So again, I've got my arm bent and I was going to straighten it. What muscle would be the main muscle to do that? You can give it a go yourself. Have a little feel. Okay, then, guys, I'm going to um, start working through, give you some answers. Um, if you have, you know, if you want to spend a little bit more time on this yourself, by all means, pause it here. Just hit pause and um, we'll catch uh, and, and then just press play and catch up whenever you're ready. Um, hope you don't then, guys. Hope you don't get to start working through them. Then. So we've got number one, um, using geometry was the radius, as we said at the start of that little exercise. So number one was the radius, one of the two bones in the um, lower arm or the forearm. Number four, connected to the tibia. So the other bone in the lower body is the fibula. Remember, we've got the tib and the fib below the knee. And the, uh, below the knee. Um, often referred to as the funny bone was, of course, the, uh, the humerus, if you remember, because it isn't very humerus when you smash it off of something. Um, number, thir uh, number 13, two-headed muscle that lies on the upper arm between the shoulder and the elbow. Um, two-headed must be bicep, yes? Yeah? So we've got 13 across biceps. There we go. So two-headed, by just like bicycle. Um, 14, the longer and thinner bone out of the two in the arm. Yeah, so we've got um, the ulna, so the other one. So in the um, forearm, remember, we've got the radius. Um, we've got the radius and the ulna. Yeah, radius and the ulna. 15, sometimes called the shoulder blade, is, of course, the scapula. Yeah, the scapula is the shoulder blade. Um, the biggest and strongest bone in the body um, is the femur. Yeah, so the biggest, strongest bone in the body is the femur, which is found in the thigh, which is thigh bone, yeah? And um, we've only got one bone there, um, just like we only have one in the upper arm, but it is the, uh, the strongest bone in the body. Sometimes seen at a barbecue is, of course, ribs, um, where... We've got our, uh, our rib cage, which serves to protect um, our internal organs and you know, some of the most vital organs, like our um, lungs and our heart, obviously. We have, uh, we have our ribs that make that cage that ex it expands as we breathe as well. So that's um, number 17, something I've seen at a barbecue. Number 18, the tendon at the back of the lower leg is the Achilles tendon. Yeah, I know we didn't look at that this morning. Um, just a little bonus one in there as well. The Achilles tendon, if you've ever um, come across the, the mythical figure of Achilles, um, he was a Greek hero, um, legend, um, whatever you want to call it, myth maybe, who was essentially um, invincible apart from one weak spot on his heel. Um, and that is where we get the name Achilles tendon from because that on the back of our foot, right on the right on the back of our heel, where, um, where you can feel that muscle was allegedly, according to the legend, where he got um, shot by an arrow and um, died, even though it was invincible everywhere else. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a Greek, Greek classic... Um, Knowledge for you this morning, I guess. Yeah, a um, little bit of a little bit of a, a fun fact, really. Yeah, where that comes from. But that is the Achilles. Um, again, it might be one that you're familiar with if you 
follow certain sports. It's a really common injury in basketball. I don't know so much about netball. Um, but Achilles is, is, is a big one in, in certain sports. Um, but that's where that is, guys, found on the, uh, the back of the heel. Uh, number 19, one of the muscles uh, in the quadriceps, the hamstring. Number 20, it runs its... Number 20, it runs from its two heads just above the knee to the heel. A two-joint muscle, yeah. So from just above the knee down to the heel, yeah, it's a two-joint muscle, and it's the calf, yeah, the back of the leg, or the proper word again being gastrocnemius, yeah. So gastrocnemius is the... Uh, is the calf muscle. Um, right, right, right. So down to the next lot of clues. Number two, another word for your butt was the, uh, was the glutes or the gluteus maximus, yeah. Number three, um, also known as the abdominals or abs, Abdominals tends to be as much as you need to know, but the proper Latin name is rectus abdominis. Um, let's have a look, actually. I want to see where some of these Latin names come from. Um, uh, rectus abdominis name origin. Let's have a look. So rectus means straight. Mm, abdominus. Means abdominal, so it's just straight abdominals. Yeah, nice. So that's where that word comes from. Rectus abdominis is just straight ab abdominals, and that is, um, of course, what they look like. Yeah, about as straight as they get. To be fair, um, okay. A large muscle group that contains four muscles is, of course, the quadriceps. Um, big group of muscles on the front of your thigh, on the front of your upper leg. Um, number seven runs from just below the knee to the heel and is involved in standing and walking. There's number seven of the soleus. So yeah, it's another part of the um, it's another part of the calf muscle. Soleus. Um, often called the collarbone is this one here, um, which the proper name is the um, clavicle. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Muscle forming the rounded contour of the shoulder or giving those shoulders them shapes is the, is the deltoids. As we mentioned earlier on, deltoids and this clavicle. Where's deltoids at? Where's number nine? Deltoid, there we go. Um, number 10, the other name for the kneecap is, of course, the, uh, the patella. Um, the breastbone is, of course, the sternum and the muscle responsible for extension of the elbow joint or straightening the arm is going to be um, the tricep. Yeah, so remember, the bicep bends the arm, tricep straightens it. Yeah, no matter where you're at, if I'm up there, bicep bends the arm, tricep straightens it. Yeah, there, bicep, tricep, bicep, tricep. Yeah, no matter where we are, um, bicep does one, tricep does the other. Um, okay, guys, that's a lot of new terminology for you this morning. If uh, perchance you are coming across it for the first time, uh, some of these longer names, like I say, um, it's just handy to know specifically the muscles um, when we get to this point where we're looking at doing our own circuit cards and trying to make sure that the circuit's what we want it to be, really. You know, you want to make sure that um, if you want it to be a nice, rounded, full-body workout, we can. If we want it to be all based on the legs, we can, but we're doing so deliberately. Um because we've got all the information. Okay, guys, I just want to leave that there then, because I feel like that's enough to um, kind of almost give you sort of some of the last touches for your um, circuit cards in the sense that understanding what muscles you would like to work, 
why and um, the exercises that you're going to pick to do so as well, obviously. Um, okay, guys, let's move on. So then I want to, yeah, I want to be thinking about um, conducting yourself professionally. Um, what that means, um, who benefits from that. Um, of course, like I mentioned earlier on, it's, it's, it's a two-way street, really. Um, of course, you benefit in the terms that you're going to, first of all, probably increase your chances of keeping your job. Um, you're also going to be building a reputation or maintaining a reputation, um, protecting yourself legally as well. Um, and making sure you're not doing anything outside the boundaries of your um, outside your remit, really outside of your uh, job role or whatever it is. Um, make sure you're not overstepping any boundaries or anything. And at the same time, it helps the um, it helps the client, it helps the new gym member uh, or your new customer to feel a little bit more comfortable, at ease, relaxed in the know. Um, informed i guess really and then they know what's coming and there's nothing that's going to sort of hopefully catch them off guard or jar them or or, or whatever and um, so what does it mean to consider yourself or to act professionally then and there's lots of things and um, there may be some that we've forgotten from this list and some that we've missed so um please again do do have a little think um Yeah, do do have a do have a little thing and think if there's any anything that you can think of that you might like to add. Um, okay then, so might as well just jump, start at the start. Best place to start. Um, punctuality, punctuality, being on time, being prompt, being there when you'd say that you will be there, um, goes a really long way. Um, if I, or I'm sure if you were booking. Um, a personal training session or booking for a class. If you turned up at six o'clock in the morning, I mean, at any time of day, when you've taken time out of your day and you've remembered an appointment, you would expect the professional to remember that appointment as well. If you got to the gym and your PT wasn't there, you know, I'd be, you'd be probably starting to ask some questions, maybe not the first time, but certainly if it kept happening, you know, if you've taken time out of your day, um, you know, I've 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 seen it myself before, where people have been turning up for a class, and I've turned up to do a personal training session, and the instructor that was meant to do the class hasn't turned up, and I've got the gym member saying to me, oh, "Are you doing the class?" I'm like, "No, I'm here for this. I don't know where your instructor is. Um, it's kind of not for me to worry about. Um, you know, I'm I'm here to do my job. He he's meant to be here doing his." And eventually, you know, you stop booking, you stop booking those classes or you stop booking that person because it's almost like you you don't feel like you can rely on them. You know, if they can't even turn up to a session that they've said they're going to turn up for, how can you trust that they're going to give you any of the tools that you need to make progress? You know, someone can only help if they're present. And that doesn't necessarily mean physically present, which leans into some of these other things as well, honor your commitments. If you've said to someone, right, I'm going to go do a little bit of research and I'll text you the link over if I, like, when I found something, you know, you might be like, they might come in for their next session. They'll be like, well, I haven't heard now from you. I haven't heard anything. You know what's happening. Um, but yeah, still lots and lots of other stuff in the on this list as well. So keeping it positive, you know, I mean, everybody's allowed a little bit of a grumble from time to time. But again, if you were paying a personal trainer or a gym instructor for their time and you turned up and all they did was really sort of bellyache about life and just be negative. And um, certainly in, in this line of work, to be professional as an accountant or as a mechanic is, is maybe considered totally different, but certainly in, in, in this line of work, there needs to be a certain amount of positivity. You know, if someone was saying to us, oh, do you think I can manage the next way up? And you're just going, no, not really. They were like, well, they're not going to believe it. They're not going to start to make any any um, progress. That's not to say that you always have to believe in someone, like, in the sense that I might be stood there thinking, well, if you go any heavier, you might hurt yourself. But you can explain that and just not be so negative. Do you know what I mean? Um, not to mention focusing on 
Like, if you turned up for a session and all the instructor wanted to talk about was all the bad news in the world, you know, wars and poverty and famine and stuff like, yeah, these are important subjects that we need to talk about. You can't bury your head in the sand and pretend that they don't exist, but there's a time and a place. And when you're working and someone's paid for your time and your attention, that is probably not the time. Yeah. Um, appropriately dressed is another one as well in terms of not just um, safety. I mean, like if you've got, maybe you're out there on the gym floor with a pair of flip-flops on or a pair of jeans, you know, you're not going to be demonstrating to someone how to, how to do a squat or a decent squat with a pair of jeans, really, are you? Um, but also in terms of um, obviously respecting people's space as well, um, you know, Again, real, real stretch, but like I'm not going to turn up to do a PT session in um in my swimming trunks or in a in a mankini or a pair of speedos or something like that, you know. Um, so yeah, appropriately dressed, but looking smart as well, you know, not just appropriately dressed, like don't just have your uniform on if it's you know stinking and I like sat sat in the in the locker or your gym bag since the last time you had it on. Um you know, thinking about hygiene as well and, and, and just, just, just appearance and the way that um, your first impression, really, I guess, um, you know, in the event that it is your first impression, um, you've got to be thinking about that as well. Um, listening is a big one. Uh, and, and again, again, it's going to change from job to job, vocation to vocation. Um, there is certainly an, an element, a percentage of the personal trainer job that feels a little bit like being a counselor or being a therapist um, in that, especially as the trust grows as you want it to. And as we should be encouraging, they're going to open up a lot, a lot more, you know, they're going to open up more and more. Um, and it might be their chance to vent, you know, um, and, and like sometimes the best thing to do is listen but also in the other sense of the word, listen, is to just not always assume that you know best because you're the professional. You know, sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. At the end of the day, somebody, you might know fitness really well, but you don't know that person's circumstances as well as they do, or their habits as well as they do, or their routine or their lifestyle as well as they do. So sometimes we need to be listening and not telling, if that makes sense. Um, lending a hand kind of goes hand in hand with with being a being a personal trainer or a gym instructor, um, you know. But even just in general, can you help a colleague out? You know, if you see them struggling at work or struggling with a customer or something, can you um, can you help out a colleague? Or if you see if you see a customer, you know, looking like they're panicking or struggling to make a decision, can I can I offer you some inf information? Can I give you a hand? You know, I used to do it when I was at Argos, when I used to work in retail. If I'd see somebody on the shop floor struggling with the, the buttons or the card machine, I'd, 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 I'd go around when the chance presented itself. I'd go around and try and give them a hand, you know, um, let them know that whatever profession they have come to, be it retail, a personal trainer, they're going to get help when it's needed, which is, is going to be a big part of encouraging people to, to come back. Um. The next one's a big one because I would argue that learning from mistakes is more important than never making mistakes um, because some valuable lessons to be learned, of course. Um, but the important thing is, 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 is that we do learn from mistakes. You know, um, if you, um, like I say, use it to inform your practice going forward. If you've written client's results down or a workout plan on a piece of paper and the next time they've said to you, oh, what did we do last session? And you've lost it and you don't know where that piece of paper is. The next time, you know, get a picture on your phone, store it away somewhere properly, like in a folder or in a client file or something like that, you know, learn from those mistakes and don't keep making them sort of over and over again. Um, the next one's a little bit tricky as well. Stay in control because that is not always within our control. Um, sometimes things will happen, but of course, best to stay in control as best as possible. And I guess to 
reassure the client or the customer that you're in control as much as possible. Even if that means in a little bit out of control way, it's like, I don't really know what's going on, but I've got the situations in hand sort of thing, you know, and staying in control all the time is, is going to be impossible. You know, there might be, and, and there's all sorts of things that, that might happen where you need to, um, adjust and adapt but that is all maintaining you sort of staying in control of the session and stuff um adequate in in line with others so thinking about what other people um might expect certainly with this word professionalism and like i say etiquette in terms of um giving people space um bad language all of that sort of thing as well, you know, um, etiquette, thinking about um, social norms and, you know, what, what other people might expect. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for not always just doing what people expect of you. But again, when it comes to being professional and delivering a service, um, like I say, you need to think about what the customer or the client expects from you as well. Um, honor your commitments was one that I mentioned briefly earlier on. Honoring your commitments, like I say, if you say that you're going to do something, or do you know what? Yeah, get yourself away home, and I'll um, I'll I'll text up your session plan, and I'll send over what you did, and you can do it tomorrow morning when you come in again if you want. And then you just don't do it. It, it doesn't look very good, and it's teaching them that what you say you will do, you probably won't, and that you almost can't. Um, be relied on again it comes back to that reliability what we're really trying to do is build um like i say that relationship that you're reliable and this word here trustworthy as well you want to be um considered trustworthy to build the best relationship and get the most out of um that client um treating everybody with respect goes across the board every profession um every vocation we need to be um, treating people equally, regardless of ability, experience, age, gender, um, race, religion, um, any of any of the above and more. Um, treating treating everybody with respect. Um, you know, it, it should come more naturally than it does to some people. Um, we'll, we'll leave that one there. Uh, polite and courteous kind of links in with the same thing, you know, but even like you say, you please and thank yous, manners go a long way, don't they? You know, thinking about how you're speaking to people, the tone that you're addressing people in. Um, like I say, I saw one personal trainer who would pretty much shout at his clients on the gym floor in front of everybody if they hadn't stuck to their diet. And you're like, well, not only are you embarrassing them in front of the whole gym, but next time they cheat on their diet, they're probably not going to tell you because you've just talked to them like crap instead of having a conversation of like, right, okay, why? Why didn't it work? Why didn't that diet work for you? Um, we'll tweak it. All they'll do is just start hiding their behaviors um, and that doesn't do any of you any good because they're not getting the results that they pay for then and you've got a client that's never making any progress because you're out of sync with each other and that respect, trust, whatever you want to call it, um, has, has started to go. Um, at the end of the day, you can say to somebody, look, these behaviours aren't going to get you where you want to be, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Um, so thinking about that one. Um, look in the park kind of links in with appropriately dressed as well, you know, in the sense that, like, granted, yeah, there's no link between knowledge and certainly physical appearance you know i think if anybody um kind of goes against the norm for looking the part for a pt i always felt like it was kind of myself you know i've i'm, I'm not six foot tall six foot across uh, built like an absolute uh, brick privy but at the same time you know um um, between being sort of like relatively low body fat and quite active and quite cardiovascularly fit, um, you know, I'm 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 stood there for me personal trainer job with me, where with me shorts on, with me gym trainers on. If I'd have been stood there in a pair of steel toe toe cap boots, it doesn't 
look the part, does it? It kind of links in with dro- appropriately dressed as well. But I mean, um, yeah, there's there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way to look as a personal trainer. Um, but again, if somebody was maybe in the gym and looked as though they had um, a long way to go in their own fitness journey, um, it might cast some doubts. You know, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one, that one. Um, the next one is not truthful and trustworthy. Yeah. Um, you're building a relationship with a client or clients or a group based on respect and, and truth, pretty much. Um, you know, little things like if a client says to you, oh, I'm like, I'm a little bit conscious about this person uh, and you say well i'll go and speak to them if you want if they're like no 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 I, I, i'm really not comfortable with that like on like try and honor that if the next time you see them and you say oh i spoke to that person for you you'd be like well i i asked you not to and now i kind of now i kind of even feel more conscious about it Do you know what i think i'm going to look for a new gym um you know strange stranger things have happened um and then of course mind your manners as well which links in with um, respect, being polite, um, you know, even just just little things like if you're walking through a door and someone's following you, can you hold it open for them and and stuff like that, you know. Um, if I was waiting to go up the stairs to the gym and you know there was a whole class worth coming down or even just a couple, I'd be like, no, nah, take your time, I'll go up, I'll go up afterwards. You know, there's no rush. Um, like I say, it goes a long way. Even when you're interacting with other people on the gym floor, like. Um, if you're waiting for a machine to be free and you're going along like, oh, excuse me, mate, how many sets have you got? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll hang about, you know? Um, like I say, there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to um, treat people. And yeah, like I say, to a certain extent, I think things that don't necessarily, um, people who aren't able to naturally do that tend to not gravitate toward customer slash public facing jobs um but let me know guys let me know if you think of any more um what it means to conduct yourself professionally um like i say in terms of just transparency let a client know what they can expect from you what what falls under your jurisdiction and not you know when it comes to boundaries I've had clients ask me for meal plans over the years. Like, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not qualified to do a meal plan. I can tell you some foods that might help you lose weight, gain weight. I'm not a nutrition expert where I can say, right, okay, we need to make sure you get enough zinc for this, magnesium for this. Um, so writing out a meal plan is something that most personal trainers aren't qualified to do. Um, but you see them doing it, which... Some clients say, as oh, added bonus, look what I'm getting. To me, it's it's a little bit irresponsible. Um, and again, stepping over them boundaries. And again, just being aware when that where them boundaries are. And maybe you even set those boundaries or some of those boundaries with the client when you first get started, you know. Um, including respect coming the other way, you know. Um not getting phone calls off your clients at midnight for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So it can be, it can be useful. It can be useful to uh, lay out and establish some, some, some boundaries as well. Um, okay, then. So how to introduce yourself to a client. So now we really are thinking more that first meeting, that first introduction um, and your first interaction with that client. So, you're putting yourself really in the best position to show this client, yes, you've joined the right gym. Yes, you're going to be accepted and, and, and feel comfortable here. And yes, I'm going to be available and friendly and approachable if you've got any questions or you've got any concerns that do arise. Yeah. So that was really my focus of an induction on meeting the client for the first time because I've been that person, as I'm sure many of you will have been, where you've been in the gym for the first time and it can be a bit daunting and a bit overwhelming and sometimes all you want to do is run the total opposite direction. Um, 
which doesn't do you any good, although uh, there's a little bit of running involved in there still. But you find it's much more beneficial to somebody um, to, to just make them feel welcome, show them that you're approachable, and you know, hopefully show them that it's the right place um, for them. So the first thing that you might do, and again, gyms have different setups these days. I worked in one gym where you paid X amount to rent um, and to work there every month and um, to have access to their equipment and their clients, I guess, the gym members. Um, and in order for reduced rent, so you pay a little bit less every month, but I used to give the gym five hours a week, 10 hours a week. I can't even remember what it was um, where I would do inductions for their gym members. Yeah. I paid the gym less to work there. I did them a favor by doing inductions when the new members signed up, which worked sort of two ways in my favor, really, because not only was um, I getting to reduce rent, saving a little bit of money, but at the same time, I was then the personal trainer that everybody knew. So when they had questions or when they wanted personal training, they'd go to the, the person that they felt most comfortable with, which is, in this case, the person who did their induction and who took the time to get to know them a little bit and build that little bit of a relationship. Um, you know, got to... The last couple of years I was PT and it would be very rare I would need to go to somebody on the gym floor and say, do you want PT? Because doing so many inductions and getting to know people in the gym, certain people will, will seek you out when they're ready for help. Um, but how do we get there? How do we get to that point? Because that's that's the aim, really. That's the uh, that's the goal. Um, and like I say, to help the, the client feel at ease as well. So for me, I always like to know who I was who I was seeing, obviously what their names were, what time they were expecting to turn up. Um, and I would make sure I was there in advance, um, sat down and set up, and not like coming through the door at the same time as, as them and sort of trying to set up while I'm saying hello and introduce myself. I'd be there early um, and ready to go. Now, one thing that I did have that worked in my favor is if I'm doing an induction, chances are that they've already filled in all their gym paperwork. Yeah, so they've joined as a member, booked their induction. So that meant that I could go to the gym database and get their form and find out their information. What is their name? How old are they? Um, you know, maybe try and get an idea of, obviously you don't profile or anything like that, but again, if you know that, it, that someone's name is John and he's, he's 70, you know, there's certain people that walk through the door where you're not going to be thinking, oh, that's him. You know, if that makes sense, you know, um, it's hard to assume anything about anyone these days, but, 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 but yeah, I, I always felt like it helped if I knew, you know, who was coming in and especially their name, because even if you can't clock them as they come through the door, like, oh, that must be them. Um, you've got to bear in mind, they're looking for you as well. They're expecting to see you. So you might see somebody come through the gym door and they're looking around and they're like, ah, that's him, that's him, or that's her over there. You know, and again, know their name so you can go up to them and say, oh, is, is, is it John? Maybe like, no, sorry. And you're like, oh, fair do. So introduce yourself anyway at that point. Um, but they might go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're not sat there at the table waiting for him to approach you and you're both doing the awkward. Is that them? Is that them? Is that it? I don't know. Um, you've sort of got that out of the way with it, like straight away. Straight away. Some of them will even go to the front desk and say, I'm here to see, I'm here to see Rob for my induction. Then they can shout me over. But I'm being shouted over from a desk where I've got my laptop set up and I've got every on my paperwork ready to go. I'm ready, um, and I can come over and 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 obviously um, show them that I'm I know their name already. I know who I'm expecting, um, and then we, and then we can move on, you know, into the rest of the session. But that that was a big thing I I thought. Um, obviously, try and know someone's name. And if you even better if you know why they've joined the gym, if they've put that on their form, what their goals are. You know, you could even show them, look, right, oh, okay, nice to meet you. I've been having a little bit of a look through through the information. I've seen that you want to, you know, lose a little bit of body fat before you go on holiday at the end of the year. Um, and, and, and you know, again, I'm, I'm, I might be wrong, but I, I feel like that sets a really good impression, you know, that's all oh, this person's hands-on. They're doing research on my behalf, and I haven't even met them yet, 
you know, um, sort of along those sorts of lines. Um, and then, of course, just interacting with the person themselves, um, you know, shake their hand. A little bit of a tricky one, this, this side of COVID, you know, some people don't like to shake hands. You know, I've always been happy with a fist bump or, or whatever it is. Or, um, of course, if it if, if you are that way inclined, then of course, you probably still have some sanitizer on you anyway at the minute. But, um, yeah, shaking their hand, uh, like I say, give them a little smile, try and be as welcoming as possible, and just say something along the lines of, hi, I'm Rob, pleasure to meet you. You know, so, so something like that. Um, maybe change, change the name to something else if your name isn't Rob. But um, yeah, anything, just nice and simple. Keep it simple. Rehearse it if you have to. You know, you want it to come across um, as sort of relaxed and as carefree as possible, even if that means doing a lot of, um, doing a little bit of rehearsing, you know. Um, so then they know your name. Um, they know that you know theirs because you've, you've sort of said um and you've sort of, you've almost broke that ice um, and you've initiated the conversation there. And then you can at least just say, right, okay, do you want to come over? Um, do you want to come over here? We'll sit and have a little chat. Do you want a drink or anything? Um, glass of water, a cup of, um, and go from there. Introduce yourself. Um, so not just your name, obviously, we've kind of done that as well, but what your role is, maybe is how long you've been doing it for, any specialties that you've got. You know, do you focus on weight loss, muscle gain, strength and conditioning, whatever? Um, what they can expect. Does that include, you know, do they get PT sessions with you and plans to follow by themselves? Do they just get the sessions when they're with you and they're on their own the rest of the time? Um, does Is that going to include a protein shake at the end of every workout or, or, or whatever, you know? Um, and just, like I say, let them know what they can expect. Um, and maybe it's even what not to expect. Say to them, look, I can't do you. You will eat this at this time. Food plan. I'm not qualified to. You need a nutritionist for that um, to make sure you don't end up deficient in vitamins and minerals and stuff. Um, eye contact. Eye contact's a good one. Unless you get the impression that the other person doesn't like eye contact, if that makes sense. Some people are really shy and there'll be some conversations I'll have where I'll sort of try and maintain maintain eye contact at the start. But if that seems to make someone uncomfortable and they don't like, or, or they're happier looking at the ceiling or a little bit more distracted, you know, I, I don't see any problem with that at all. But certainly try try and maintain and establish that eye contact um, if you can. Um, so they say that the eyes are windows to the soul. Uh but yeah, don't um. I wouldn't necessarily force the issue if, if somebody is as long as they're listening. And you're making the effort. Um, set expectations for how long the induction will last, um, and whether you'll take questions as you go or whether you prefer them at the end. That's entirely up to you. Um. Again, you've got to let them know how long the induction will last because they might be thinking, "Oh, it's a ten-minute job." I'll be away in a minute. I'll be able to go and get the kids from school. And like 45 minutes later, you're putting them on another machine and saying, right, so this one does this. And, you know, um, so get that out of the way with. It might be the other way around. They might be expecting a full show round of every machine in the gym. You might get up to the gym floor and say, right, there's your cardio stuff. There's your weights. There's your changing rooms. Give us a shout if you need anything else. And they'll be like, well, I've set aside an hour of my time for this and we're done now. You know, so again, the expectation of how long it will last um, like I say, whether you'll take questions as you go or just answer them all at the end. I used to take questions as we were going around because I could just answer them there and then. And you can also find out maybe some more information. Like they might be wanting to ask, right, what's the best exercises for my legs? If you ask that as you're going around, you can show them. You can show them, right, this machine does that, that machine does that. If you get to the end and they're like, well, I really want to work on my legs. What machines work those? You're already back at reception at this point. You're just going to be like, well, the leg press does this, does that, does. And they don't know what any of the machines are called, you know. Um, so I used to take questions as we were going round. But at the same time, I didn't used to make my inductions that long. I was always aware that if I show you every machine in the gym, how it works, we'll be here all day. And 
by the time we're on to number four, you're going to have forgotten how the first one worked in the first, like anyway. So the way I used to do an induction, as well as all of this, you know, trying to be polite, trying to be enthusiastic, motivational, um, trustworthy, eye contact, all of that sort of thing. I used to make the induction specific to their goals. Um, which comes back to this bit, do your research. Before you met them, do you know what their goals are? If you don't, once you meet them, find out what they are. Yeah? You could take somebody around every weight machine in the gym and be there a whole afternoon. And then you get to the end and you sit down and say, right, what are your goals? Oh, well, I'm training for a marathon. All I want to do is run. Right, well, I could have just shown you the treadmill, you know, um, rather than the other million machines that we've been around. So I used to say to people, what's your goal? Oh, I want to work on my stomach or my, um, under my arm or around my bra strap or whatever it might be. Um, what are your goals? And then I can sort of customize what I show you from there. Um, so it might be right up here to work, you know, this muscle. I'll show you this machine. Yeah, to work this muscle, I'll show you that machine. When you're ready for something different, when this starts to get boring or you feel like you can do more, let me know and I'll show you some more stuff. Yeah? Like I say, rather than show them 20 machines, 18 of which might be totally useless because it's not related to their goals at the minute. There may be some time down the line that they want to use that machine. But, you know, if you're approachable and friendly, there's no reason why they can't just come and ask you how that works when they're ready to use it, you know? And then they're slowly building up the amount of machines that they feel comfortable on instead of reverting to the only two machines that they can remember how to work because you just chuck too much information at them at once, if that makes sense. So that was my style anyway, you know? And again, that's, that's not necessarily right or wrong it just worked for me um like i say i used to like when people would come up to me and say look rob okay i'm used to that machine now i'm used to that one i'm used to that one can you show us something else now i'm a little bit ready for something new you know i'd be like that, that's awesome because that shows that they're making progress with the things that you've shown them they're ready for something different and maybe they're even growing in confidence where they want to try something different um which is all it's all progress. It's all really, really good stuff when it comes to um, training somebody and helping them better themselves and develop themselves, you know. Um, their confidence and how happy they are in their own abilities is more important to me than what somebody weighs, you know. So it's, it's, it's all part of the process, um, trying to help people grow in confidence. You want to encourage them to get out of that mindset of, like, it's the gym and like I'm in, I'm in somebody else's environment. It's like, no, it's your environment as well. And over time, newbies will come in and look at you and think, oh, I wish I'd been coming as long as they have. Well, you've, you've just got to get started. But, but yeah, um, building confidence is, 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 is a big part of it as well. But yeah, when it comes to the uh, induction style, like I say, there's no right and wrong. It might change from person to person. Um, but that was the way that I used to do it questions as we went i'm going to find out your goal first and then try and find make your induction specific to that because then you end up with obviously people pursuing their goals and hopefully people scattered across the gym using different machines to chase their different goals if you get a load of newbies in and show everybody the same five machines it gets to the point where that's all anybody wants to use because that's all they're confident using you know, uh, okay, then, guys. Um, good body language, happy vibes, be confident and play the part. Yeah, um, like I say, almost like linking in with um, sort of looking the part as well, and good manners and stuff like that, um, and, and and sort of being positive. Um, I guess what you're trying to do is make yourself an encouraging, motivational presence to be around, really. Um, and, of course, positive body language, um, good vibes, confidence on your behalf goes a long way as well. Um, 
You know, if, if you're saying to somebody, right, we're going to get this, we're going to do this, this is going to challenge you in this way, um, right, let's go. Sounds a lot more confident, you know, and they're going to, they're going to buy into it. Whereas if, if you were like, well, what I think we'll do, um, we'll maybe get the boxing pads out. You'd be, you'd be like, well, are we doing it or are we not? Like, like, like are you confident in, in your plan or, or, or not? Um, cause you've got to remember you're trying to show that you're trustworthy and that it's, you're somebody to be sort of believed in as well and be reliable. Um, and then the last one, it's a hard one cause it's, it's, it's a difficult one to teach if somebody doesn't have it naturally. And that's a genuine interest and a willingness to help. Um, I I passed my level three PT qualification with a lad who came and started at the same gym as me. And he knew he knew his stuff, man. He, uh, he knew his information. He was really switched on when it came to sports science um, and all of that sort of thing. But his ability to connect to people and relate to people um, and, and just willingness and genuine interest in helping people wasn't necessarily there, you know. It's not for me to say why, um, but it was, it was, he didn't stay in the job very long. He moved on to something different. Um, whereas I admittedly didn't know as much as him. Um but always had this genuine interest and, and, and willingness to, to help people and try and try and encourage and motivate people, which, you know, may partially be why I'm in this, still in the same kind of line of work and certain other people might not be, you know, besides being, being very lucky to be able to do what I do. But there's definitely a genuine interest. Now, the beauty of this is the majority of people that don't care and have an interest in helping other people probably aren't going to sign themselves up as um, gym instructors and personal trainers and, and stuff like that. Personal trainers, maybe, maybe um, there's some egos in personal training, guys. There are some egos in personal training. And I'm sure for some people, it's more, I want people to look at me and tell me how amazing I am. But um, yeah. We'll talk about that another day, maybe. But, 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 but yeah, guys, you've got to remember, like I'm saying, here, what we're trying to do is give a real positive experience to the client because it's, it's the same as anything. When you do something for a first time, whatever your experience is, is 100% of your experience. You know, if you get on a plane for the first time and fly for the first time and you experience really bad turbulence and it makes you sick and really worried... When next time you think about flying, that's going to be the first thing that you think of. So if someone comes to the gym and has a really crappy experience, next time they almost psych themselves into joining the gym and trying to start this new fitness journey, they'll remember, you know, the crap time that they had last time and they'll talk themselves out of it potentially. So what we're trying to do is the opposite. We're trying to give somebody such an amazing impression where next time they have to come to the gym, they're kind of, they will, and they're maybe even a little bit excited to, even though the, the doubts and the anxiety and stuff might still be there. Um, you know, it's almost believing in this person, usually long before they believe in themselves, truth be told. Um, but as long as they think somebody believes in them, they're much more likely to turn up. Yeah, it goes a real long way. And again, guys, let me know if you can identify any more of those, if you can think of any more information um, or any more little, little tips or hints that you might have used in previous jobs or that you picture yourself using if you were working with a client. Um, let me know, guys. Let me know any that we might have missed. Um, okay, spinning on then, spinning on. So having a look at our homework for the weekend, um, our workbook, um, our workbook task um, is 1.1 in the uh, Development Practical Skills Workbook as well, which is uh, linked in the description below the video as well. Um, so in the box, can you describe how you should conduct yourself in this situation? 
what skills and techniques might you use to make a new member feel at ease. So imagine you're a fitness instructor working in a small gym in your local area. Your job role is to meet and greet any new clients and run them through the induction process. Yeah. So if you were in that scenario, you're the instructor working in the gym, your job's to meet and greet new clients and give them an induction. How would you conduct yourself in this situation? So thinking about everything we've talked about um, over the last hour in regards to being professional um, and, and giving them an induction, how would you choose to do it? Like I say, there's a couple of things that we've given options. Do you take questions during or at the end? How would you do it? Yeah. Um, so the, the second task would normally be a pairs task, but because of um, lockdown, because we're, we're learning online, um, it's going to be an individual task. Um, so um, in the box below, can you write a brief description of how you plan to introduce yourself to your client, um, including like body language and eye contact and stuff like that? Nice and straightforward. I don't know why we've got that little, uh, that little black slide at the end there but yeah guys that'll wrap us up for this morning a um, couple of big sort of two 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 halves to today's session so again remember that this link will still work in the future if you do want to go back and sort of revise those um, muscles and where they are in the body and stuff again um, and of course um, the homework for this week or your, uh, your little task for this week is page two in your development practical skills and techniques workbook, which is what we've just been looking at there. Yeah. Um, so again, um, I've just got this slide up here for a couple of minutes at the end. So you can always come back and check your homework and when the next session is going to be um, during the week, if you wanted to get this session up again, but not listen to the full thing, if that makes sense. Um, right, guys, right, right, right. So we've got three weeks left to go. We've got three sessions left to go. Um, just trying to get a little preview for next week's session. Um, so next week, um, we'll be looking at components of fitness. Um, computers on the go slow different components of fitness um and fitness testing as well so how can we carry out testing to make sure that the type of fitness we are trying to develop is developing yeah but we'll get to that next week guys that's uh that's one for next week plenty to look forward to in the meantime please don't forget to do the survey for the day's video um, check out today's fitness video and even if it's just to get some ideas of some lower body um, exercises um, if you want to do a fitness video but not that one still click that link and it'll take you to our playlist and you can pick an abs workout or it's a nice little stretch if that's feeling more your speed today um, but yeah guys please don't forget to uh, do that survey it's not even 30 seconds just click the link in the description put your answers there and hit submit yeah, you don't need to save it, download it, fill it in, send it back, any of that. Um, so page two in the Development Practical Skills and Techniques Workbook. And we will, of course, be back next Monday, um, 10 to 12, um, 12.30 with the fitness video as well. Um, okay, guys, you know where I'm at in the meantime. If you need me in the next week or so, um, just drop me an email or if on the... Off chance you haven't got it yet, just give one of the guys at the office a shout and I'm sure they'll be happy to pass a message on. Um, if I don't hear from you in the meantime, guys, have a good week. Stay safe. Take care of yourself and those around you. And we'll be back next Monday. Um, until then, guys, take care and I'll see you later.